Our gospel reading this morning is from John 20, verses 1 to 18. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Then Peter and the other disciple set out and went toward the tomb. The two were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent down to look in and saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came, followed him, and went into the tomb. He saw the linen wrappings lying there and the cloth that had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple who reached the tomb first also went in, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples returned to their homes. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had been lying. One at the head and the other at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. When she was saying this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there. But she did not know it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? For whom are you looking? Now, supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. And Mary turned around and said to him in Hebrew, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not hold on to me, because I have not yet ascended to the Father but go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my father and your father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And she told them all the things he said to her. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Each of the Gospels retelling of the resurrection is a little bit different. And in this one, we see that Mary Magdalene alone goes to the tomb. She carries on her shoulders the weight of the whole community of believers who had left everything in order to follow Jesus. And she could not shake the image of Jesus hanging lifeless on the Roman cross two days earlier. Mary was going to the tomb that morning to remember, to cry, to grieve. She walked in the streets in the darkness before dawn as if in a dream or, or more like a nightmare. She may have noticed the merchants, merchants stirring into action as their week began. <clears throat> she may have smelled the bread baking ready for market. But then again, she might have missed it all. Focused as she was on getting to that dreaded encounter with the tomb and her dear friend on the other side of that large stone. So when she got to the tomb and she saw that the stone would, had been rolled away, she lifted her lantern trying to grasp the horror of the discovery. Somebody has stolen the body. And then it was off to the races. She returned to tell the, she was running to tell the disciples that she had seen what she had seen and had not seen. And a couple of disciples then raced back to the tomb. Out of breath, 
from the round trip, Mary now ba was back at the empty tomb and she was inconsolable. Someone asked her why she was crying. Who asks somebody at a cemetery why they're crying? Her answers are in the past. A dead body. Stolen. And then she recognized who was speaking when he uttered her name. Mary. She's suddenly fully in the present. Because here is her teacher. When Mary realized that it was Jesus, she reacted with overwhelming emotion and she tried to hold on to him, to the idea of him. I picture her leaping to her feet and hugging him or perhaps just pivoting as she sat and grabbing a hold of his knees. This was a grief-stricken, confusing moment. Mary is being as real and as human as anybody else. Holding on to Jesus for dear life. Now the Bible doesn't tell us how long that embrace lasted. I picture Mary sobbing tears of grief and gratitude. I picture Jesus consoling her, reassuring her. But then eventually says something, Jesus says something which sounds harsh. Don't hold on to me. That tender moment wouldn't last. It, it couldn't last. For one, Jesus was asking Mary Magdalene to be the very first person to preach the good news of the resurrection. She needed to go and tell the rest of the followers. Second, Jesus was trying to let Mary know that there was something different about him. As I mentioned in the newsletter, <clears throat> Jesus was not a patient who was brought back by an EMT with CPR back to life. This was not a resuscitation. It was a resurrection. It was a transformation. We don't have the words to explore what happened that Easter morning. But what we take as an article of faith is that Jesus had died and was raised, transformed, a new beginning. Not a restart to an old storyline. Now Mary had no time to ponder the complexities of the moment. But obedient as ever, she ran yet again to the other followers to complete the telling of the story. She had told them earlier that someone had stolen a dead body. Now she could proclaim, I have seen the Lord. And we repeat Mary's words to honor her faithful proclamation. When, Mary said to Je when Jesus said to Mary, do not hold on. I cannot help but think about these times we are living through. It feels like every, if it feels like every sermon I preach this year is about the pandemic, you're probably right. What his words awakened in me was the realization of what Mary was doing. She thought she was holding on to the same Jesus. To her same teacher. Why wouldn't she? There he stood. It was him. But actually, Jesus' request not to hold on to him came after he was raised. So an actual transformation had already taken place. She wasn't holding on to the before Jesus, before times Jesus. She was embracing the risen Jesus. I'm wondering with you then about the moment when this global suffering from this pandemic is over. Will we be embracing the before times version of ourselves? Or will we be somehow transformed? I think this in particular about us as a church and as a community. Surely, we can hold on to the identity we have as God's children and our call to serve, but this pandemic experience is not leaving us unscathed. This awakening or reawakening of social justice can't go unexamined. It would be a missed opportunity, downright a waste, if we just held on to what once was familiar simply because it's easier 
than to reflect on the changes we need to make as a church and as a community. Now granted, most of us have just been on survival mode in various degrees through this pandemic. But I imagine we've also had the opportunity to reflect on more deeply into how our life as a community and as a congregation has changed. As the trial unfolds for the officer who murdered George Floyd, we are taking stock as a society about the structures like the justice system, the police, the government, the bank loan system, which keep our society civil, but at the expense of some. And the structures which perpetuate a system of the haves and the have nots, of the deserving and the undeserving, of the welcomed and of the marginalized. I realize these are not easy conversations. In fact, I think it's a conversation we will be having for years if we do it right. But I raise the sensitive nature because given our circumstances, it could be tempting to hesitate. We might feel like, ah, we're too stressed to deal with that. Or we need to slow walk those reforms. Or when the concerns of the pandemic face, fade, so will the urgency to address those glaring issues of injustice and inequity. We can't just go back to normal. If the pandemic has given us the chance to reflect on something, is that normal worked for some in the society, but not for all. We can't unsee that. Pay attention to the things that are near and dear to us, which we should perhaps no longer hold on to, and which things have actually been transformed and are, we are being called to embrace. Believing in Easter is not an academic exercise. It's a call to put our faith in action in practical ways, living as if death does not have the last word, living as if transformation is, is real and is possible. And so this calls for personal and collective reflection to consider how our expectations of what being church can be about, participating in transformation ourselves and in our congregation, not just about eagerly returning to the way things used to be without giving God a chance to do something in us. To consider how our policies as a, a city, a state, a nation truly listen to all who are being governed, transforming the systems which have kept so many outside looking in. To consider how our personal choices of, of consumption and purchasing power can be not just a personal decision, but to think about how I can be, I can be seeking a collective and just benefit for all in a community. Transformation is hard though. We like the butterfly. But I tell you, I bet there was a lot of hard work inside that chrysalis. There is no manual for Easter. There's no manual for transformation in our lives. Living into this earth-shaking message of the resurrection, first shared by Mary, means letting God guide us on how to hang on to transformation and how not to hold on to what we can faithfully leave behind inside the tomb. Thanks be to God for God's word for us. Amen.